and thank you for joining us again on Hocus Focus. I'm Sarah Mondaini. And I'm Thomas Sheridan. And as always, your support does mean the world to us. And we genuinely appreciate all the comments, likes and shares that continue to pour in. And it's truly heartwarming to see our 40 and community growing week by week. And I'm also thrilled at the incredible response I received from last week's chat with Dan Updike. The engagement on that video was overwhelming and it's yet another testament to the fantastic audience that the channel has. The new equipment I've been eagerly awaiting has finally arrived and I can't wait to share that with you. And in the spirit of transparency and gratitude for your support, I'll be putting together an unboxing sort of self-indulgent show and tell video, a sort of behind the scenes glimpse to show you firsthand where the ad revenue and donations go. Um, and so you can see how it's being re reinvested back into the channel. And I've got a new green screen behind me. So that hopefully now that should stop my disappearing into the Zoom background. And um, yeah, that's me for this week. Um, how's your week been, Thomas? Yeah, it's been good. I've been very busy, but I can't complain. It's, the weather's been quite mild. And uh, interesting topics we'll have or discussion we'll have on the psychic weather this week. Yeah. And how and did you talk in Cork or was it Kerry? It was in County Kerry and just like the place that looked like Middle Earth was like an ancient church deconsecrated with me on the pulpit. And uh, it was just surrounded by just some stunning mountain scenery. The, we have a special bonus this week after this show immediately on my channel. We will have that as the first VON on the road talk. So it'll be two hours of extra content with me and it'll be the audio from that lecture down in Kerry. Right then, let's buckle up for another great episode and get stuck into this week's topics. Our first topic tonight is about a Renaissance polymath whose intellect and interests have left a mark in the fields of mathematics, astronomy, alchemy and the occult. I'm talking about John Dee and he was born on the 13th of July 1527 in London, England. And he was the eldest son of Roland D, a textile merchant, and Joanna Wilde. And he went to Chelmsford Grammar School, where his intellect quickly shone through. So his father sent him to St. John's College in Cambridge at the age of 15. And while he was there, he excelled in mathematics, obtaining a Bachelor of Arts degree in, 40, in 1545 and a Master's degree in 1548. And his mathematical genius earned him a reputation and he was invited to lecture on Ecludian geometry. He published the Propedium Arta Aphoristica, which presented his views on natural philosophy and astrology. And he also wrote the Monus Hieroglyphica, in which he gave a single mathematical symbol as the keys for unlocking the unity of nature. And I'll put that on the screen to show you now. And Dee was also into astrology and alchemy. And in 1555, he became a trusted advisor to Queen Mary I, and he became the court astrologer. Now, Dee was arrested for conjuring or witchcraft in 1555 after casting a horoscope of Queen Mary I, but he was exonerated a few months later. Fortunately, though, during the Renaissance, Astrology, it was thought of as a science rather than a supernatural dark art. And he was also the scientific advisor to Queen Elizabeth I. And in his letters and correspondences to the Queen, Dee used a unique signature which consisted of two interlinked circles which symbolised the eyes of the monarch and the number seven. And the combination was a symbol of protection and good fortune for the Queen's reign. The use of the number seven was considered quite an auspicious number, a lucky number seven. And the signature or the talisman even was a gesture to invoke a happy and blessed reign for the sovereign. When Elizabeth I died in 1603, she was succeeded by James VI, who detested all things related to witchcraft. And so Dee received a cold reception and he was removed from his role as advisor and royal astrologer. Now, John Dee was a Christian, but his intellect was shaped by the influences of Hermetic, Platoism, and Pythagorean doctrines, in particular, 
the Pythagorean doctrine idea that numbers held the fundamental essence of all existence. And it was that that led Dee to explore the idea that divine power could be channeled through the use of the language of mathematics. So for him, the inherent order and harmony found in numerical relationships were the pathways to understanding the mysteries of the cosmos. And in this mixture of Christian faith and esoteric mathematical philosophy, he envisioned a bridge between the earthly and the divine. And it was that kind of outlook that laid the groundwork for his explorations in astrology and the occult. And his fascination with the occult also led him to develop an interest in alchemy and hermeticism. And he believed in the possibility of communicating with the angels and spirits in order to obtain knowledge and insights and de practice numerology and divination using tools such as a crystal ball and the famous spirit mirror made of obsidian in his attempts to speak to angels. But he found that he was unable to scry, and so he had to seek the aid of a medium. And Dee collaborated with Edward Kelly, who was a medium, and in a series of sessions, they claimed to have communicated with angels and received divine revelations. And together they uncovered a form of angelic communication and magical knowledge known as Enochian magic, which they said was revealed to them during their seances and scrying sessions. These records stated the angels provided them with a unique language, glyphs and a system of magic that came to be known as the Enochian system. The Enochian language is described as angelic or celestial and it consists of a series of letters and symbols and Dee believed that this divine language held the key to unlocking profound mystical insights and accessing higher realms of knowledge. And he documented the Enochian revelations in his journals and he created tables of letters and symbols that form the basis of the Enochian system of magic. And both Dee and Kelly believed the visions gave them access to secrets contained within the Book of Enoch. Now things went a bit weird when during one seance in Bohemia in 1587, Kelly claimed that the angel Madimi insisted that the two men share everything they had, including their wives. And Dee and Kelly questioned whether this was spiritually or carnally and a scroll appeared in Kelly's scrying, which stated that it was both. And that caused Dee to question his faith, and it caused Kelly to want to forsake working with the angels. But when they told the wives, they were appalled. And Jane Dee, apparently, according to Dee's diary or journal, fell weeping and trembling for a quarter of an hour, after which she eventually acquiesced to God's will. And Joanna Kelly's specific reaction isn't recorded, but it should be said here that Kelly didn't get along with Joanna. But nine months later, Jane gave birth to Theodore D, who very, very well may have been fathered by Kelly. It all sounds a bit complicated to me, that. Anyway, one of Dee's most enduring contributions is his vast library, which he collected throughout his life. And his personal collection of books and manuscripts was, was one of the largest in England at the time, which is said to have had over 4,000 volumes. And Dee's library was a reflection of his diverse interests, which covered subjects ranging from science and mathematics to astrology and the occult. Now, Dee was also accused of espionage on behalf of the English crown. And upon his return home from the continent, his cherished library had fallen victim to vandalism. But despite this, he later resumed his service to the Queen. However, with the succession of King James of Scotland and England, Dee found himself eventually dismissed from the royal service permanently. And he pursued further studies at the Louvian in Brussels, where um, he broadened his horizons there. And later on, he shared his knowledge by teaching Occludian geometry in Paris. And then after that, on his return to England in 1551, uh, his career took a different turn again when in 1596, he came up my neck of the woods when he was assumed the role of the warden of Manchester College. 
However, despite all these amazing accomplishments in his later years, he struggled with financial hardship and isolation. And after his death in 1608, much of his collection was dispersed, but some of his books and manuscripts have survived and are now housed in various institutions, including the British Library. And he's faced challenges and criticisms during his lifetime, but his work has helped bridge the gap between academic pursuits and esoteric knowledge. And in my opinion, he was a brilliant man, an intellectual with a passion and a conviction for the esoteric. He was a true Fortean, a true genius, really. And I'll let you continue from there, Thomas. Yeah, I would agree with that. I've read a couple of uh, bios of John D. And what always struck me was he always came across as very human in them. He was almost a lovable old man. That's the impression I get. And in fact, you get that feeling that Queen Elizabeth I felt that way about him, calling him as her, her, her royal intelligentsia. Now, when he, you know, when that was all going on, England was in the midst of a, basically a religious civil war. The, Re the Reformation was raging. Queen Mary had tried to restore the monarchy as a Catholic. And there were, it wasn't a good time to be a Catholic in England. And D, we don't know if he, you know, he, he's a religious Christian, but whether he, main, he maintained being Catholic or Protestant, that's that's kind of all over the place. But anyway, he she asked him, uh, you know, it, her, her reign was very, you know, dangerous. There was numerous attempts by the Jesuits to try and assassinate her, particularly the ones from Spain. Uh, Spain was at war with uh, was at war with England at the time, and Ireland was allied was at war with England and allied with Spain, and so there was all kinds of Spanish assassins slipping into England from Ireland, so she was in tremendous danger, and so she asked Dee to draft the horoscope, and the horoscope it was a, that was a risky thing, you know what do you do do you tell a queen that she's uh, she's going to be dead in a couple of weeks or anything like that. But the horoscope was bang on to what transpired. He said that she would not only survive and be a good monarch, she'd probably be England's greatest monarch and would unite the kingdom, which she did because the British Empire was basically a product of her reign. Now, there's lots of interesting stuff there. He once he referred to the British, um, he invented a term, as far as I know, the British Empire, and he called it Empire, I-M-P-I-R-E. And it, not only did was she delighted, but with his um, astrology chart that he drew for her, but he, she actually couldn't be seen too friendly with him because there was still the sort of Presbyterian, you know, Puritan thing going on that she couldn't be seen too close to a witch or a, you know, a kind of a devil man. So she kind of like didn't shun him, but she had to kind of say, you know, you, you can't be seen around me too much. But apparently. This is the story and how it goes, is that he created the British Empire and he said it would be based upon ships and the building of ships. And he he actually decided how many ships were to be built for the Royal Navy and they were to have wood brought from the four kingdoms, England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And these ships would be used to actually make England into a world power as the British Empire. Now, this is remarkable stuff because it all came through. There's also stories that he may have created the storm in the Solent uh, in the south of England, which may have destroyed the Spanish Armada and wrecked them off the coast of Scotland and Ireland and this kind of thing. So there's, there's, that's I think that's very plausible, actually, that he, he, he whipped up a wind. There's other things, too, like if you go in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, it, 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 his portrait is not only there, the famous it painting of him, uh, but also it's when I was there last time I was on tour, so his uh, scrying mirror and his other ma his uh, sigillium and other magical implements are all held within the Ashmolean Museum in, in Oxford. Now, the uh, scrying mirror is a very interesting story behind that. How he got his hat. Now, it's been confirmed now that the, that the stone used in obsidian actually came from a specific part of Mexico, which is produces this stone for scrying now how he got that at that time is a hell of a story in itself because 
England was basically banned from trading in the Americas because the Spanish Empire controlled everything, really. And any British ship that came anywhere near the Caribbean or the coast of Mexico had been blown out of water. So somehow, very early on in the history of, you know, the age, the golden age of navigation, and that's a big part of this as too, somehow this obsidian mirror had made its way, it's Aztec and a genuine, it's been shown from like, you know, geological tests in recent times that it actually is the real thing. How that got from, how this Aztec mirror got from Mexico to England is, is a strange story itself. I don't know how it could have happened, uh, it, unless it's it, the Spanish brought it to Ireland and it was somehow smuggled from Ireland into England. But even that would be an amazing story by itself. So who knows how he got, that's almost magical in of itself. His code word for Queen Elizabeth, like you said, was 007. And a lot of people mis mistakenly think that his code word was 007. No, it was Elizabeth's. It was Elizabeth's code word, magical seal, was 007. Now, it is also, we cannot uh, detach his career from navigation. This was, after all, the golden age of navigation. And he was a remarkable cartographer and map uh, drawer and uh, draftsman. And he basically was caught up in the spirit of those times. You had the great, you know, Portuguese age of navigation. You had the Spanish, the Dutch. And he was, you know, he was right in the middle of that, too. And you'll find what a lot of these cultures that have these, you know, gold that have this golden age of navigation. Magic and the occult wasn't too far away. It, you know, Freemasons were all over it. Knights Templars were all over it. And even when, you know, Peter the Great built his navy in Russia, in St. Petersburg, the, the, basically the, the maritime school was also an occult school as well. So that's an interesting one how, you know, the occult and, and maritime, the golden age of navigation were never far away from each other. Now, Kelly, well, this is what, you know, it's like you could never make I would hate to be the fellow would have to make a film on these life because it'd be like Lord of the Rings because of all the different stages in it. So you get the impression that John D was a harmless old guy, quite lovable, a very sincere man who was driven by his quest for knowledge and who had no agenda, none at all. He wasn't interested in schmoozing with the royal courts or any of this thing. When he met Kelly and they started to do the, uh, the channeling of Mandimi and to bring it forth of a Nokian language, well, of course, you have to look at who Kelly is. The some some people portray Kelly as a kind of this this like kind of like magical Dell boy who came from Ireland and sort of like you know bedazzled D with his knowledge and his ability to actually work magic and you know channel and things like that. And other people say, and I'd be kind of agree with this that Kelly was actually still the real deal. He was still capable of, you know, necromancy and all the, uh, and magic. And he, he wouldn't have, you know, he wouldn't have bedazzled D just on, you know, on, on, you know, walking, talking the talk. He would have had to walk the walk as walk as well, D being a very practical man. So some of the biographies and some of the impressions of Kelly, I, they underplay his, his power. They underplay his abilities. Kelly came from the Amain family, which are in the northwest of Ireland, and they claim direct lineage from the two of the Dallin. They have that belief that they're descendants of like, magical princes and stuff like this. So that's interesting of itself. So in those days, you would have happened to have some kind of pedigree in order to actually get to Hamden Court, where you know where he, he was with the you know. So the 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 Anakin sessions are remarkable. You know, you can say what you want about Kelly being, you know, a scammer or, you know, a Jack the Lad. But the Enochian thing was real. It came through. And, it, you, know, he came, he, you know, if he was to make that up in his head, that's impossible because it's not, it, it brought through a whole new language, not only its alphabet, but all, everything else connected to it, such as the grammar and the syntax and the, the use of phrasing. Now, Colin Wilson claims that there is a, a tribe in, in northern Iran that speak a language and use an alphabet 
very similar to Enochian. And that's interesting too, if that's, you know, if that could be confirmed. Uh, sometimes the intros to some of Carl Wilson's books are a bit, he's, he's playing that kind of game, you know, like where, but anyway, that's what he, he claimed. So that's even amazing of itself. And also the ciphers were done in a very complicated way. I think they were done in reverse. So as, as Kelly was bringing through uh, these, these things from the croquettish Mandini, this very sort of sexual, uh, you know, so I think it's a female gin, it sounds like, which ties in with the northern Iran, Iraq, Iran thing quite interestingly. Uh, Kelly had to have, no, D had to have a book of ciphers and immediately translate from one in reverse to the other so the the comp so you know if kelly was making all that up he'd be one of the greatest genius minds that ever lived you know so it's the real thing or he's one of the greatest geniuses of all time either way it doesn't make him a scammer now his reputation as and even crowley said that like d was you know d was probably taking advantage of the old guy because of you know his connection to the court and stuff but, you know, this is also the Reformation. So the, the the English monarch was constantly changing between Catholic and Protestant, Puritan and, you know, Papist. And it was, an, it was a very dangerous to be on the wrong side of one or the other. That's only the reason, like I said, the only reason he got off of the astrology thing for Queen Mary was because the, the Protestants could still considered, uh, well, they hadn't, they weren't, they weren't, James hadn't come down from Scotland at that point. So the Protestants considered it science rather than sorcery. But it could have been a few years later, he could have got his head chopped off, you know, he could have or been born to the stake, been hanged uh, under a different, under the under James. So the, the reason why they went to Bohemia was alchemy. Kelly told, they approached, I mean, this is amazing. They went to King Rudolf II of Bohemia in his court and he basically there was money problems and he said he could produce gold uh, you know using alchemy and a, and they gave them they gave them a, a set them up in the alchemical tower in Prague castle which is a remarkable place and apparently he did it they did it kelly produced gold he produced the alchemical you know he produced alchemy alchemical gold but then the holy roman empire fell afoul of the Catholic Church and the and basically they collapsed and this put them in a very dangerous position. D was very lucky to get back to England at all following all the shenanigans of the wife swapping and all that kind of thing while Kelly, he died trying to escape from prison while he was locked up in Bohemia. He fell he fell off the barricades when he fell off the the poor Colossus when he was trying to get out of the prison at uh, a castle. So that was the end of Kelly. So these D, D, D has the gives me the feeling that he was project he really was protected by angelic beings, considering how close he, he sailed towards the edge. You know, he was almost like the Emperor Claudius that way. He was right there in the power structure. But because some they, they saw him as a harmless old Egypt, he was kind of left alone, and he survived to die of old age. And it's it's great that most of his 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 his, body, his library collection does survive, and most of his writings have survived. We don't. It's not just a matter of conjecture. That's why his biographies are quite accurate because there's so much he's still be left. So I agree. I would say that he was one of the greatest magicians of all time, one of the greatest thinkers of all time. He was the eminent character of Elizabethan Renaissance England, even more so than Shakespeare, in my opinion. And on top of that, he comes across as kind of like a kindly old, a kindly old man. So what's not to love? Was this the King James of the King James Bible? Yeah. Eek. Right, yeah, so that was very dodgy then to get on the wrong side of him. Well, she, what's her name? Elizabeth didn't have any issue. She never produced a child. So uh, it, he came, he was next to the heir to the throne. His mother was Queen Mary, came down from Scotland, and he had been schooled in the Scottish Kirks. 
and he had been, you know, a fanatical anti-witch hunter. He had, you know, he had basically been heavily inspired by the Malefic Harem, and he thought he was him and his bride were being murdered by witches in Scotland on the way back from their honeymoon in Denmark. And he actually was, you know, he actually went to Denmark and places like that and was inspired by the the, 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 the horrible treatment of witches. Yeah, he was a, a pretty, a, you know, D was very lucky to be out of England when, uh, but then, then again, they tended to pick on the working class. So D was very lucky to be in Bohemia. See, this is what I'm saying. He's had, it's almost like he had protection from a higher force, one of those type of characters. Not only did he, um, his involvement with the occult, but I found a really interesting tidbit about him. I had no idea, but he once helped to produce a play, which yep. was a play called Peace. Um, yeah, while he was in Oxford, Oxford, while he was a student in Oxford or a professor at Oxford, wasn't he? Yes, it was written by a Greek playwright, and I think he was in charge of designing and making the beetle, which the play's main character uses to go visit the gods with. And he, he yes. did, did the he design creates, function. He created special effects and pyrotechnics, yes. and apparently he blew people's... See, this is the whole thing, like magic, stage magic as, as well. Yeah, that that's that that's kind of like what it gave him a, ning, a name. As this kind of like you know illusionist, yeah, like you say, apparently it was so realistic. The audience thought it must have been magic to be that good, and some of the audience claimed he'd made a deal with the devil to make it work as well as it did, and that was what started off his reputation as a magician. Probably, if I'm sure it was magic. You often wonder if he brought through some Lovecraftian entity or something like that to, to appear as the as the, as the as the creature on stage. Yeah, it makes you wonder, doesn't it, if those um those types of Lovecraftian entities are just there above the psyche, just there waiting, you know, to be picked and used and brought down and used in art. Yeah, yeah. And divination. I mean, it was nobody like him. I mean, he was, you know, he was a one-off, but he wasn't um, narcissistic or showmanship. He was very matter of fact about how he went about his life and his work when you look at his photo it was photo when you look at his image and his paintings he does look like a very dear man very gentle very um i don't know just somebody that very nurturing that's the impression i got you probably even saw kelly as a kind of a son figure yeah like a surrogate son yeah i liked him i got a nice feel from him he's a nice man Every biography I've read has always left me coming away thinking I, I would have liked to have met him and sat down and had a chat with him. <clears throat> of all the biographies you've read, which one have you found was the best? Which one would be a good uh, one? Oh, oh what with? was his name? I think his name. I, the best one of all is, it's buried up here somewhere. I, it's the Queen's called The Queen's Conjurer by Benjamin Woolley. Queen's Conjurer. That's the most accessible and the most comprehensive and the one that deals the most with the magical aspects. Right. I shall be looking there's, a, there's also there's also a channel four documentary on YouTube called Masters of Darkness or something, which features one on Kelly. It looks great and it's enjoyable, but it's a bit sensationalist. It's mainstream, but it's, isn't it? But it, it's but it's from when channel four was good though. So it's got Alan Moore, and it's it, it's stylistically, it looks brilliant. I'll have a look. I'll put the link to that in the description box if people want to go and watch it. But the, the Benjamin Woolley one is highly recommended. Very enjoyable read. Another interesting fact that I found about him, which I didn't know about, <clears throat> was that he could have um, had the claim on most of the land that eventually became Canada, Due to his friendship uh, with the explorer Humphrey Gilbert, and yeah. as a payment for Dee's support, Gilbert had agreed to give him all the rights to any lands that he discovered in the New World when he went off exploring. And because um, Gilbert died on the way back to England in in 1583, if he hadn't died and he'd arrived back in England, he would have had a claim on most of what is now known as modern Canada. And I just think that is an amazing piece of information about a man. I mean, wow. 
Uh, but also, if that had happened, maybe he just would have become a, a wealthy man of leisure and wouldn't given us all the work that he gave. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you know the whole thing of the gods move in mysterious ways. Do we know what happened to the uh, mirror? Is that in the museum? Yeah, that's there. Uh, it's in that's the British there. Museum. Yeah, no, it's not. It's in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Right. But it goes on tour, so this you know way museums make money by lending exhibits out. So, which the that's Ashmolean Museum is one of the the best museums in the world. It's actually better. I like it better than the British Museum, but um, it, it's just has a not. It's just an. I think it's really impressive for a, a small city, but uh, it's in there along with a sigillium, which is a hexagramical shaped, uh, basically just, it's made in metal, and it has all the magical symbols all around the outside, which you would use for as a kind of a, a decoding for ciphers. And his books, and I think his crystal ball is there. And if the actual the actual crystal ball Mandimi appeared in is actually there. So, you know, we're very lucky to have all his goodies. They're still there. And about 15 years ago, during renovations of the alchemical tower in Prague, a secret room was found. And in there, it had it literally the key had been turned in 1500 and closed. And then it was all sealed off. So maybe some of his items that him and Kelly used are probably still in there too in Prague. That's what? an amazing story by itself. That the Nazis never got that. The Nazis, you know, went through every inch of Bohemia looking for uh, the SS for um, and it, anything to do with the occult. And it's amazing they never got that. And a good thing too. Yeah. Well, they also tried. To, they also tried to blow up a side of side thing. The SS tried to blow up the the old new synagogue in in Prague, and the, the explode. The, it failed to detonate, and they had to run out of town because they're being chased by the I think the Russians, and uh, that's the synagogue. The golem is allegedly buried in the rafters of the attic. Golem Joseph, that was made by you know, the famous Rabbi Lodz. Right. And that was around the same time that, that Kelly and Dee were there. One thing I find sad about Dee's life, and it just goes to show that history repeats itself even to this day, and that is that the Puritan Christians, um, especially the writers who saw occultism as satanic, um, they also viewed John Dee the same, and they saw these claims of speaking with angels and demons um, as being satanic and he was a, a dark man and it's just like the same kind of attitude that we've we've seen with um marina abramovic and other great um artists and thinkers and people who've brought things great things to to modern culture yeah and even crowley people re re refuse to see that the, the beneficial things that he's he's done d is also considered possibly to be the inspiration for Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, although there was a real Danish occultist by the name of Faustus, but many people think it was actually based on D. Right. So that is the great thinker that was John D. Do you know any interesting facts that we may not have had time to cover? Do you have any book recommendations about John D? Maybe you're an adept with the Enochian system of magic, so please keep the conversation going in the comments. On December 1st, Mercury enters Capricorn and will stay there until December 23rd. We might notice this in the way our mind works and how we perceive reality, how we communicate, because Capricorn is ruled by Saturn, which is a lot more grounded, emotionally distant and strategic than fiery, impulsive Sagittarius, that is much more prone to losing its cool or to ignore important details. Capricorn is pretty much the exact opposite. 
and it is also a lot less positive and optimistic and much darker in its approach. In the extreme case, it is a little bit on the depressive side of things. But the sign is a really tough cookie and not easily rattled. So this is why it can also be an extremely hard worker and very focused. This is a good placement for getting things done or making plans. But we must watch out for Mercury, which will be out of bounds until December 14th. Out of bounds means that Mercury's nature will most likely manifest as erratic or annoying behavior from other people, miscommunication, mental unrest and unpredictable events on a smaller or larger scale. It can also mean having a harder time sleeping, which many people have already been reporting since the Sun has moved into Sagittarius and made a conjunction with Mars. And this sign is so notorious for nervous hyperactivity. And with Mars, we have an ultra quick trigger that can therefore facilitate outbreaks of tempers, health issues, weather phenomena, and even wars. However, I think that the sun's position in Capricorn will have a much more stabilizing influence, at the very least on our own psyche. Mercury retrograde is beginning on December 13th. So Mercury is acting crazy until December 14, but will also go retrograde on December 13. So we have a bit of a chaotic Mercury in this second half of December. And the retrograde will last until January 1st, but the post retrograde shadow only ends on January 21st. What this means is that mid December until at worst the end of January next year, we will see a, a particularly unstable, chaotic or simply annoying time. It's also very possible and I think more likely that there will be phases of rest and order though, intertwined with sudden eruptions that can be of an unpleasant nature. I don't think this will be non-stop chaos, but more like a few better days and a few not so great days. The most dominant influence upon any Mercury retrograde, however, is your own chart. And therefore, I will make a separate post about that for all the zodiac signs. On December 4th, Venus enters Scorpio, which can make us more prone to drama in relationships with old grudges or enemies coming to the surface, issues connected to women in particular, also self-esteem or jealousy issues. Venus is in detriment in this sign, which means that the qualities of the planet aren't so freely expressed because Venus is more on the side of sweetness, enjoyment, luxury, whereas Scorpio is all about self-preservation and it can sometimes have an overly aggressive undertone to it and has a dark secretive quality which isn't really in line with Venus nature. The alluring yet internally troubled femme fatale archetype is a very good description for Venus in Scorpio. On December 16th, the Sun makes an exact square by degree with Neptune that will be felt most intensely for around two days prior and two days after December 16. But the square by sign is during the whole month until December 22nd. And Mars is also present in Sagittarius along with the Sun. So what this means is that it adds a general unsteadiness globally as well as in our personal lives. With Neptune and Pisces, we can get deception and manipulation too. My advice would be to be very vigilant of your mental and emotional health and try to find ways to calm down by reading, listening to music, etc. So you can avoid hyperactivity, but also injuries, because injuries to the lower spine in particular are more likely under this influence. Insomnia could also be an issue, or bizarre dreams that leave you restless and in a weird state where you don't quite seem to have exited the dream realm despite being awake. This aspect could, however, also bring creative inspiration. 
Neptune in Pisces is highly conducive to viral infections and fatigue, especially with a stressful square to Mars conjunct the Sun, which is a really impactful trigger. And therefore, we need to avoid anything that weakens the immune system, such as overusing alcohol, for example. Another effect of this time could be a generally greater psychic openness, which can be great for some and not so great for others because it simply destabilizes their mental health. So make sure to keep your walls up just in case. On December 22nd, the sun enters Capricorn, which marks the winter solstice. Capricorn season is defined by a very pragmatic, non-dreamy, emotionally distant quality that is also quite disciplined and all about unspectacular work, meaning not a lot of fuss. And it's great for achieving long-term goals or simply taking important steps towards achieving these goals. The rather cold and practical patient character of the sign can feel like everything is slowing down, including your body. And this makes it even more important to focus on the small steps rather than trying to push yourself all the time. And you have to make sure that you take a break every once in a while. Medically speaking, Capricorn season can bring a heightened risk for bone issues, knee problems, arthritis, mineral and vitamin deficiencies, and anything that facilitates toxic buildup, notably in the liver. On December 23rd, Mercury moves back into Sagittarius. Remember, he's retrograde. So this could mean heightened instability once more and the potential for hot-headed communication or miscommunication, short tempers, etc. So mind your brain-mouth barrier for the sake of your own peace and also set priorities for communicating with people because not every argument is worth getting into. Not everyone's opinion is so important that you absolutely must reply to them. And some of them are really best ignored. Our main focus during this month should be on our personal health and well-being, our families and friends, what interests us, our spiritual growth, and what gives us a sense of purpose and contentment. This should definitely go for our communications as well and what we allow to affect us immediately, be it news or social interactions or the food we ingest, etc. With the sun in Capricorn, we will find it easier to thrive in the face of adversity, however, because the sign represented by the mountain goat is extremely tough and resilient and therefore a quiet, slow, diligent manner of going forward without a lot of fuss, drama or superficial distractions is the most in tune with the current time quality. Be careful of the aforementioned depressive moods that can also come with Capricorn season though and know that they are very likely to pass. It's pretty scary at the moment, globally speaking, so therefore we have to turn inward and towards the people and the things that truly matter to us. This doesn't mean ignoring reality, of course. Quite the contrary. It means, in a very pragmatic Saturnian sense, to conceptualize our place and our priorities within reality, instead of getting lost in dark thoughts or fear or even impatience. Just as you must think before you talk, you have to strategize before you move. And sometimes the best strategy is minding your own business, letting the chaos take its course, even if it's disturbing, and allowing things to wind down for a while in your personal life or your business, whatever. The well-known saying, it's always darkest before dawn, is most accurate for the days leading up to the winter solstice and will be felt physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. On a medical level, the December astrology warns us to be conscious of what we eat and to try to avoid a nervous stomach, sensory overload, or overexcitement of the nerves. Taking breaks from social media, for example, would be a pretty good idea. The current times are indeed scary and they feel like something bad could happen any second, which it kind of does. 
and I'm afraid this quality will dominate for a while, but keeping our feet on the ground and our eyes on our priorities will go a long way. There's always something worth looking forward to and moving towards, and we just have to seek it consciously, which of course is not always easy. The days from December 24th until the end of the year will be part of a special broadcast, so stay tuned for that. And I will also post the difficult red alert days for December separately, so make sure to follow me. All the links to my social media channels are on my website where you can sign up for my newsletter or book a personal reading. This week, we are reviewing the 2018 movie, Await Further Instructions, directed by Johnny Kevorkian and starring Sam Gittins, Nija Nile, Grant Masters, Abigail Cruttingdon, Holly Weston, Chris Sadler and David Bradley. And the story starts during a Christmas gathering of the family who despite outside appearances are a dysfunctional lot and quite a broken family and the family's made up of Nick and his girlfriend Angie, Nick's pregnant sister Kate, Kate's husband Scott, the granddad and Nick's parents Tony and Beth. And the already volatile atmosphere takes a darker turn when Katie directs some racist remarks at Angie, who's Indian, due to a terrorist attack that was reported on the news. The situation intensifies when a strange black substance surrounds the home, trapping them within the confines of their home. And soon these unsettling messages appear on the TV, warning the family of contaminated food and instructing them to decontaminate themselves by scrubbing down with bleach. And to further complicate matters, they're urged to take a mysterious prickly pear that drops down their chimney. And despite Angie's reservations about these prickly pears, Tony, the father, insists that the family follows these eerie instructions, even though the syringes appear to be previously used. And then tragedy strikes as Grandad has a reaction to the mysterious prickly pear and he dies while vomiting a weird black liquid. And the film then becomes a story of the dire consequences of blind compliance in the face of an unknown and sinister force. And the father, who got on my nerves to some degree, well, to some tune, has complete trust in what the TV is requesting, believing it to be an emergency broadcast from the government. And anyone in the house who dared to question the source of that broadcast was met with violence and the usual response of, Oh, so you think you know more than the national disaster response, do you? Do as you're told or you'll put the lives of this family at risk. And things go from bad to worse as the orders from the TV get more sinister. And they seem to come in response to the arguments and fear and opinions that have gone on in the house. And it leads to a horrific ending. The ending is just, yeah, you wouldn't believe it. It goes from a psychological horror to an almost Lovecraftian type of ending but having said that the concept behind what was going on was spot on and I love the idea that the TV network or the TV becomes sapient almost and all the time you were watching it it has been watching you studying you and storing all your fears and opinions and reactions to what you watch on it and then using all that information it's gathered on you over the countless years using it against you as it rises up to become the new God, the new religion. And incidentally, one of the things that stood out the most for me 
in that film was every time the TV was in the shot, it was on a shelf with a brass crucifix hanging on the wall behind it, like the family had subconsciously made an altar for it and symbolising that the family worshipped everything about it. It was their God, and over the years they put their total faith in it. And the surname of the family is Milgrams, and that was purposely done because it was named after the Milgram experiment, which concluded when individ which concluded that individuals are instructed when they're instructed by an authoritative figure to harm or potentially even kill someone, a significant percentage, say around 30%, possibly as high as 60, would comply with those instructions. And the consequences that arise when individuals abandon critical thinking and autonomy in the face of authoritative commands is a theme that's dominant throughout the whole film. And it's also revealed in the film that the family lives on Stanford, Stanford Street, which was a reference to the Stanford prison experiment, which studied similar themes of perceived power and authority. And a final noteworthy aspect I want to mention is the film's Christmas setting, where the festive decorations and family gathering become sad symbols. And each year, it's like the emotionally burdened wife in the film holds on to this flicker of false hope anticipating that this Christmas season will somehow heal the wounds of the past. And Christmas to her has become a beacon of hope, giving her the feeling of something to look forward to amid the family issues. And the psychological horror elements of that film against that Christmas backdrop just makes it even more dystopian than it already is. And I thought it was um, just a juxtaposition that made it feel even more miserable than it already is and it was the familiarity because it was a British film for me it was the familiarity of the holiday season clashing with the psychological turmoil and horror that gradually kind of unfolded within the storyline just gives it another layer of misery and I mean they go to bed on Christmas Eve for God's sake only to come downstairs on Christmas morning trapped in a dystopian nightmare it, it just doesn't get any worse and it plays on your mind for a good long while after. And um, in fact, it made me feel a bit sick and not very nice afterwards. And it got me thinking about certain narratives that we've all just gone through. It's probably an eight out of 10 from me. I liked the film. I loved the concept of it. I wouldn't watch it again just because of the way it made me feel. But I did love the concept and how many truths it uncovered in relation to blind obedience from the TV, how it can make families turn on each other. But it did make me feel very miserable for quite a few days afterwards. And um, yeah, that's why it's got an eight out of 10 for me. But I suppose you could say if it's done that to you, then it's a good film. Well, it gets a 10 out of 10 for me. I consider it a masterpiece and I will be watching it over and over again in the years to come just to complete further analyze what i think is a piece of cinematic prophecy it was made in 2018 and perfectly predicted what would happen two years later uh the 2020 to 2022 period right down to the christmas lock-ins and lockdowns and everything i know some people might say that it was predictive programming but i don't i don't believe that not, not for a small independent film it, it, that, that no one's seen. It's vanished into obscurity. It was a, a friend, Tina, who taught, sent, sent me a message about it. You have to see this film. It, 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 I think it's incredible. I would say the best Lovecraftian horror film since John Carpenter's The Thing in 1980. That's how highly I would rate it. I, 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 it like you said, it, it, kept, it was so very well written and acted. The character of the father that caught on your got on your nerves was a perfect foreshadowing of the, you know, stay home, saves lives, social distancing, blah, 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 needlecraft types of the lockdown. The the government is is the is the final arbiter of existence. Even your own intelligence and common sense is to be discarded. The way it would happen to was so amazing. The way you know, this dysfunction, look, I don't have many happy, I don't have any really happy family Christmas memories. And I know many people don't. And I would consider that, I, I, I was at my, the happiest Christmas I ever had in my life, the first of us, one was on my own. 
And uh, I, ne this whole, I never bought this whole thing as in sad to be alone at Christmas. No, it's not sad to be alone at Christmas if your family is or that you're dealing with a situation that's completely fucked up, you know. It's not. So the, the, the son, I really identify with the character. He didn't want to go there for Christmas. And it was really his girlfriend that dragged him there. He got that impression to try and like show him that, you know, that he, he's got himself settled down now. And that, not that the family has fallen out or anything like that. It's just that he can't deal with it. Lots of people can't deal with Christmas. So this was this this demon from the abyss that came forward was almost like an egregore of these dark Christmas experiences. When the house was covered in this skin, it was like a metallic skin. It was like it, they were they were inside the black Christmas box, the Christmas presents. That's what it was in there. And, you know, not so much these days, but when we were growing up, Christmas TV was everything, wasn't it? You were people were glued to see absolute bullshit like you know Billy Smart's Christmas Circus and other crap like that you know, and they just sat down and watched it because they thought they had to very NPC kind of behavior. I, I nearly shuddered when the prickly pear package came down the chimney uh, flew. That just to me was like this is like a this film is going to be mind blowing. The the TV with just the single messages on the screen was extremely Orwellian, especially when it's, you know, remember it started with humiliation ritual. They have to all strip naked and wash themselves down with bleach. Even that was incredibly prophetic. Do you remember when Trump got all that hassle about bleach? Remember that? And here it is in the film, uh, you know, two years previous, or like, you know, 15, 16 months previous. And it, the, the way the entity was, not only communicating them to them with the television, but also was wired into it. It was the television was part of the entity's nervous system. It was just and and that final scene where it shows the the flickering lights of the TVs in the neighborhood as the camera pulls away. You remind me of that. What was that? That famous uh, Twilight Zone episode where the uh, Mul was it Mulberry Street where they all went uh, crazy on the street. It reminded me as a homage to that. And I, I, I can't praise this film enough. I, I, I thought that the character, the actor who played the father was outstanding, but they all were. And it didn't, you know, I was kind of, you know, no, no offense to my American friends, but I was kind of glad it was a British film because no one does dystopian sci-fi as good as the British. Uh, they don't have a Hollywood ending. There's no John Wayne moment. There's no one riding off into the sunset. It, 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 that's just what I like about that. And uh, there was no Hollywood like moment of redemption or heroics involved. It you know it. I would have loved to see. Now I love the Tom Cruise version of War of the Worlds. I love that film, but I would love to see a version done in this style. You know, more closer to the 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 original version is written in the H. G. Wells novel. And that's very much what I kept thinking about, but they weren't going anywhere. They were stuck in their house. And it was it, it was just perfect. All the archetypes on the show were on the film were perfect. And the mother's character, she's trying to hold her, she's gone mentally ill as it's all falling apart, but still has to be, it's Christmas, ties in with the whole like this fake jubility that many families have around Christmas, pretending they're having a lovely time when it's actually the, the inside they're being boiled alive almost, but with, with attention. And so I give Await for, awaiting, await for the Instructions 10 out of 10. It's a masterpiece. It's one of the greatest dystopian sci-fi films ever made and the best Lovecraftian film made since John Carpenter's The Thing back in 1979, 1980. There was a clue at the beginning. You don't see it. You don't realise until later on what, what's going on. But do you remember at the beginning of the film, Christmas Eve, they were watching the TV and there'd been a terrorist attack on the news. Yeah. And um, they all ran in from the kitchen because it just so happened that it was just at the end of the street on the shopping precinct, on their shopping precinct. And it was um, done by Indians and the girlfriend was Indian. So the TV at that point 
the entity in the TV was was playing on what it knew would wind them up. They were, you know, it just so happened to be down the road and it just so happened to be the same race as the, the young lad's girlfriend. And it was yeah. that, that, that was when the shit hit the fan and the racist remarks started flying across the table and it just went downhill from there. And it was that that set the ball rolling. And it would have been different in another house where there was different tensions, maybe, you know, other things. And so the entity was learning the psychology of the family before it devoured them and turned them, you know, became their, their living God. And it was like very much a little crappy thing how it became a God at the end. In fact, the father thought it was the risen Christ, uh, you know, in this form. And do you remember what at the very beginning when it, they thought it was metal shutters, they thought its skin was metal shutters. That reminded me of when they welded the people into apartment buildings in Shanghai and the places in China when they welded them into buildings. That's what that reminded me of. It's remarkable that this film would prophesize the future that was coming just down the road. Even the way the it knew who, who had, if, if any of the, if any of the prickly pears hadn't been used, it knew. And uh, the the son didn't want to do it, and he just said something like "fuck it" when he when he injected himself. He would have been like us. He didn't. He wouldn't want to do it. And you know, they were even saying, "We don't even know if this thing is tested or not." I mean, just it was unbelievable. Like what we're doing, what we're what what what, what foreshadowing was contained in it. The character played the father. He appears in a lot of films playing that similar kind of curmudgeon, this old codger, and he's great and he was brilliant in this part as well. And. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a film people need to pay attention to because it's a film that's a it's the world we're living in now. And, you know, I think what we call NPCs, normies, are already living in what that, that was at Christmas. That's how they're living right now. And it, I watched that and you said, OK, it made you feel depressed for a few days because it doesn't have a happy ending. I walked away feeling great, and I'll tell you why. It made me realize that people like us, we didn't fall for what that, what, you know, wait for instructions predicted would happen down the road in, in the short few, short term to come. It made me feel like I, I had escaped that prison because I'm not transubstantiated. I don't have Mother Hydra's babies <laughs> crawling through. You know, that's where you want to, at the very end, they showed like a mother's height as babies all over the neighborhood. But that was, that's how it is in real life if they're all, you know, transubstantiated. It didn't make me depressed. It didn't have a happy ending. I think it was because we just lived through it. And um, it, it was so, it's such a realistic film. I'm okay, it was an unhappy, dysfunctional family, but it did. It was the Christmas theme and the decorations yeah, yeah. and the, what they were watching on TV and all that. It was all very familiar, just like in the movie Threads. It was a very familiar set. It's things that are familiar to you, so it has more of an impact. And uh, I tell you, since I watched it, I've been out and about to the shops and things, and I'm looking at people and I'm thinking, would you be like that man? Would you be like that guy? I bet you would. And I'm just, I don't even want to get the bloody Christmas tree out now after watching that. <laughs> of course they would. It also depends in the psychological state you were in when you watched the film. Yeah, you watch Treads. Guess what? You survived the Cold War. We were born into the Cold War and we survived it. Yeah, yes, this film was about the 2020, 2022 period, but we survived it. We got out of it without Mother Hydra's babies in our in our in our veins and we're not trapped in that neighborhood that all the others are who have been transubstantiated are in. So that's the way to look on it. I mean, I see it as a kind of an affirmation that I, you know, I didn't go to the house on Christmas Day and you didn't go to the house on Christmas Day. And, you know, it was very symbolic at the end that they showed like middle class suburbia because that's where Mother's Hydra's babies for right now are ravaging through and they still don't see it. It's an excellent, it is an excellent film. It's just a very, very dark subject because it's so close to home and near, it's all, well, it's all around you. When you, you look around, it's all around you. And I think that is the personification of when you say the spiritual force that came and took over this planet on the 20, in 2020, that was a perfect visualization of what the hell it could have been or what it is. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what we're about on Focus Focus. We're, 
not just a, a happy paranormal 40 and show. This is why we covered threads. This is why we cover the work of H.R. Bigger and uh, Marina Abramovich. We're not afraid to look at the dark side and the, and the shadow and stuff like that. So, I mean, that that's I think that's what will that's what makes our show stand out from many others is that we are we are we are diving into places that others fear to tread. And, that, and this, film, this film is part of that. It did make me grateful to be out of the illusion. When I oh, watched absolutely. Oh I God. I'm I was... so glad I'm not part of that world. Oh my lord, was I thinking the same. I, I, I was just like thinking like my worst my worst life would be the stuck and to be stuck. And any time in my life afterwards where I've tried to like make amends by going to, you know, those kinds of things, they've always, always, always been miserable experiences to the point where I don't do them anymore. And as miserable as that film was, the one positive that you take from it is that in regards to Normyland and what's going on out there, you're not missing anything. You're better off out of it. 110%. So it's a, it's, a, it's a morality play in many ways. The fact that they cited the Stanford prison, prison experiment and the Milgram experiment shows that they were saying to you, if you can watch this and fully understand this, that's why I say a lot of normies are kind of like, don't like that film because it reminds me of myself. Uh, but our, our world, I've, I've chosen to stick myself in. Absolutely. That was to me when I walked away from that film. It was like, you know, that's what the moral, if there's such a, if there is a moral in that film is that, you know, don't, you know, if you step into that world to get along, to, to go along, to get along, you know, it, 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 but when 2020, 22 came along, you would be the food for Mother Hyde's babies. It, it comes it comes with real real life consequences not just social ones another not another interesting thing i need to look up the reason why but the director of that movie's died since i don't know what's happened to him oh i didn't know that let me google it now i'll cut this out let me google it and see that makes you a bit suspicious doesn't it yeah um right almost as well almost as if he knew Someone had leaked what was coming down the road and he tried to tell us. You do wonder, don't you? He died on the uh, in November 2020 and um, let's have a look. Heart attack. He was 48. That sounds to me like suddenly and unexpected and it's exactly the time they all started popping their clogs. That's the all it says. Time. Heart attack. The filmmaker had a heart attack on November the 4th, according to sources close to him. Um, oh, and he was travelling between, because he, he was born in Cyprus, he studied at London's University of Westminster, and uh, he travels up to Edinburgh and Los Angeles and places like that. So there's a good chance that he would have. Oh, he would have been, yeah, he would have been uh, Jabberwockied. Yeah. Oh, the irony in that, the irony in that, isn't that, isn't that something? So he died wow. of a heart attack at 48, and that's... Wow. No you, mention you just, of an illness, nothing. You just don't know what you're going to get on Hocus Pocus. No, and also November was when the first round of, of sacrifices to Mother Hydra's babies began. So did he, did he predict his own death? Well, I mean, you know I've been talking about for years how the artist, artistic process is prof, prof, prophetic. Uh, because of the con look, we look at all the the Simpsons episodes that have become true in real life. You know, that's because the sheer concentration when within the artistic medium, uh, let's transcend space time, and the muse, whatever the muse is, then communicates ideas to you. But not, you know, depending on how intense you are, they will actually give them to you from the future. And that's what sounded like that poor man to me. Wow. Yeah. And so that's another, I think in years to come, Sarah, in fact, mark my words if you're listening to this show, in years to come, this film will take on a mystique of its own and it'll be like the Wicker Man. People will see it the same way. They'll go, you know, what the, you know. Especially with 
because we're watching it in hindsight now. So you're watching yeah. it with a new a new um, sort of consciousness. Yeah, and it will only develop as this whole thing goes further into the abyss. So maybe I will watch it again then with a new, a fresh set of eyes and I'll have a look for the layers in it this time, some more layers. Well, yeah, it sounds like it did, but uh, it, it did. I've watched films when I've been in, in not in the best of mood to watch that particular kind of film and it got me down. Then I'd watch it years later and then I'd say, oh, it was, I, that was actually quite entertaining. So it depends on your mood at the time, but it sounds to me like I would definitely watch. This is a film that people will continue with continually analyze it's well it's like the mist right the end of the mist is the most horrible ending uh you know on a film i actually think i would actually put this as even more horrible than the mist as bad as that is it, it's very triggering it sets you off because i was watching it and my mouth was open and i swore quite a few times i actually nearly messaged you and said i'm watching that film you know yeah you know I, well, that's how it was for me literally goosebumps and hair standing on end and not because of the shock and horror but because I can't believe they, this guy, this man predicted this and he, he looks like he fell victim to his own warning go figure you know it's the, within you know within class, I have a book called The Lives of the Artists it deals mostly with classical artists in the classical age and so many of them you'd hear stories of them making a statue of some figure who'd been poisoned or something and they ended up being poisoned themselves so it's like the artist the portrait of the artist as a living oracle that would be a good title for if you already, if you already did a book on these things or just, maybe one day we'll do a, a special for Hocus Focus the portrait of the artist as an oracle and, to, and just, just have the show about predictive art from the Simpsons to this to George Orwell the only other thing I wanted to add to it was the poor girl, Angie, had a cold because she'd picked up a cold because she worked in the hospital. She was a yes. nurse, so she picked up a bit of a sniffle. And yeah, when but the... it, was all, it was also winter and she was Asian. And when the TV said there's somebody in your um, your household that's infected, you need to get them find out who it is and get them quarantined, they all pointed the finger and they said, she's got a cold. It's mm. her, and they threw her in the bedroom with the dead body, didn't they? That was quarantined her. Well, I mean, I'm hearing stories still of people who told me that their families wouldn't let them go in the house for Christmas yeah. because they weren't transubstantiated. Awful. And that actually, it was Christmas time, wasn't it, around 2020, when most of the trouble started when it came to Christmas and people who weren't didn't need yeah. the prickly pear, weren't allowed to go to family Christmases, and that is when the shit hit the fan, really. Yeah, 20, Christmas ended of 2020, going into 2021, absolutely. That's when all that nonsense went down, and the TV <laughs> was saying things like, you know, don't don't have so many people and be in certain rooms. And Oh, yeah, that was the worst. But you see, this is what, in our upcoming book, we talk about, Sarah. We talk about how watching these films and TV shows, and this dystopian sci-fi and everything else, gives you a subconscious set of survival skills that when this real shit does go down, you don't end up being, you don't end up in the jaws of the beast because you've already seen it conveyed in allegory. Yeah. Like, like the young lad in Salem's Lot, his father said to him, why do you like monsters and magic and all and, and all this stuff? Why do you have build models of Frankenstein and all and the posters on your wall? You haven't grown out of it. it. It but he survived and got away with David's soul, whereas parents were like destroyed by you know the vampire. That's why. That's why he learned it. That's why he was interested in it. He got out, and probably with the Memphis Three last week, the same thing with Christopher Eccles. It was his interest in the cult that landed him on a false charge during the satanic panic, but it was also the same interest in the cult that made him survive prison and eventually get out. That's why I like this community that we've got, because we can all help each other, because it's we've got the we've got the the now and the strength to get through these things, but you still need the support of other people just to hold you up on the bad days when you feel like I can't do this. Uh, well it's good to know that you're not the only one in the world feeling like that. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I think that takes the sting out of it. <clears throat> so that is this week's folk horror. Await further instructions. And if you decide to watch the film or if you've already seen it, please do let us know and share your thoughts about it in the comments. And as the long winter nights continue to darken as we approach the winter solstice, will Sarah have more insights, techniques and tips to deal with the encroaching shadow as the days continue to grow shorter? This is Sarah with a Psychic Hygiene Report. Does the struggle of overwhelm feel familiar to you? Whether it's that never-ending to-do list at home, the demands of work or the expectations placed on us by others, <clears throat> the weight of these obligations can create a never-ending cycle of stress and anxiety. And your ego, always hungry for more accomplishments, adds to this burden, leaving you feel like you must constantly do more and in a state of constant overwhelm. So this week, take a well, consider taking a step back and allow yourself some time out. And despite the initial fear that everything will fall apart if you do, the reality is different because by disengaging from the constant demands of the ego, you can create a peaceful space to breathe and reevaluate your priorities. <clears throat> this psychic hygiene practice is a conscious decision to break free from overwhelm and providing you with a moment of respite. And in these moments of pause, you can reconnect with your higher self and your inner self, and you realize that there's more than enough time to address what's truly important. Letting go of the need to constantly work allows you to relax and clear your mind. And in this calm state, the overwhelm begins to disperse, and you can hear your intuition guiding you. And just stepping back a little bit not only breaks the cycle of overwork, but it also brings a sense of trust that everything will unfold in divine order. Even during periods of rest, the universe has a way of aligning things and trusting in cosmic order in this way offers relief from the perpetual toil that can dominate our lives. Remember, it's not a crime to pause among the chaos. Take the time to read a book. Smell the aroma of your morning coffee and enjoy every sip or go for a leisurely walk somewhere. Society seems to glorify constant productivity, but our moments of stillness are not wasted time. Instead, they are essential for your psychic well-being. Your ego might protest, but these pauses are not only moments of self-care, but also opportunities to recharge your batteries and gain a fresh perspective. Whether it's through a brief break or a quiet stroll, it all contributes to your mental clarity and emotional balance. It's like when you're trying hard to solve a complex problem and the answer just won't come. And when you're having this kind of struggle, taking a break becomes a powerful tool for clear thinking. And stepping away allows your mind to react, to relax and create space for our in innovative and intuitive thoughts to come in. And it's very similar to the way answers just simply drop into your awareness when you're least expecting them. So reading, drinking coffee, taking a stroll, these seemingly simple acts are real deep acts of self-love and psychic hygiene. So realize that even in moments of inactivity, you are nurturing your spirit and allowing yourself the space to thrive. And that's my psychic hygiene suggestion for this week. I have called this a cognitive holiday where you just you need to kind of like put the brakes on your mind. So something, what you want to come in, comes in. Yeah. I, I would say another good one is creativity, but don't do doing hobbies, but don't tackle anything challenging. Like if you paint, don't get all the oil paints out on the canvas and all that stuff and expect something to happen. You might, you're better off doodling or writing in a journal and then just chilling out and that they will, 
the muse will arrive when it's needed. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed the psychic weather this week. Good one. The psychic hygiene. <laughs> I really enjoyed my I I really enjoyed your psychic hygiene report this week. Very good. Right up my street, actually. Thank you. You're welcome. And the second topic tonight is one I've been wanting to talk to with Sarah for a while and you guys. And that is the subject of the Easter Island Moai statues, the famous Easter Island heads, as they used to tell us. Good synchronicity today. I went into the garden center when near up the road from where I lived, and they had just gotten in some concrete Easter Island head planters, which was kind of made me giggle. But Easter Island, about as far from anywhere as you can get. It's not too far from the southern pole of inaccessibility, Point Nemo, and it's not too far from where Cthulhu lies waiting, but dead but dreaming in Rael. Now, I first saw these things in artwork when I was a kid. I remember seeing a painting of the South Seas as a mural in a cafe or restaurant. And that was the first time I saw, it was a themed cafe restaurant, the first time I'd ever seen uh, the heads, the Moai heads. And, and you know, they're one of those things like there's nothing else like them in the world. And immediately when you see them, they're in your consciousness, they're burned into your mind forever. There is a strange design to them. Uh, there's They're highly stylistic. And they're a place I've always wanted to go. In fact, I nearly did go a few years ago, but the lockdown destroyed it, even though it had flights and everything booked. And maybe it was fated or something. Uh, but on Easter Island, you're so far from other humans that the nearest humans to you are on the ISS space station when it passes overhead. That's how remote Easter Island is. And yet, uh, this vast megalithic culture sprung up on this tiny island, this tiny small island. Now, when the first Europeans arrived there, now before I, I want to start getting into the history, I want to first say that the Easter Island Moai represent, for me personally, everything that's wrong with mainstream archaeology. And historical timelines and everything else and i'm going to explain this to you during the course of my intro as to why i think uh the whole mainstream story around the moai is absolute nonsense firstly the first europeans arrived there in 1722 and all the moai and you're talking about almost 900 of them 900 and some of them 33 feet high were still standing then something happened about a century and a half, a century later and continued for 50 years where most of them were toppled over. I would say this is Christianity, whatever the mind bar, the Abrahamic mind virus had spread to the island. And the first thing you do when a, a culture becomes a subject to the Abrahamic mind virus that attacks anything it sees as evil or demonic. So that's a strange one as well. When the Europeans arrived, they were standing within 150 years of this they would most of it been knocked down there's been 900 discovered to date which is colossal for such a small island and they're considering some of them are 33 feet high and even the modern ones would have taken a team of 150 to move them as there's capital all around the island some are still carved into the walls and they haven't been extracted from the quarries and the, one of the prevailing things is that much harder rock, they're made from basically compressed ash. It's called tuff, T-U-F-F. -F. And it's volcanic ash that has, and that's going to be a big part of the story later on this. It's a big part of the aspect of this story is, the, is what they're made from. But they claim that they were digging around them and then they suddenly hit much harder rock. And they couldn't get them out. So that's why they were half completed. Maybe. I don't know. I haven't been there to examine them. I was hoping that was one of the reasons I was hoping to go there to see if there really was a different type of rock. 
behind that left them unfinished, but they do seem to just stopped. Uh, now, again, take off, go, go in neutral, and you see that the standard arch archaeological story is complete nonsense. Firstly, they claim that they were built by the Rapai Nui culture, culture, which is a Polynesian type culture that exists on the island. And according to mainstream science, they were built between 1200 and 1500. What's this based on? They don't know. They don't know. They, they, that's just a guess. That's just a guess. Based on a lot of it, the primitive people couldn't have been this advanced to produce stuff like this. It has 900 of these. There's all kinds of nonsense theories about two cultures on the island uh, ran out of food as the island's resources diminished. So they started building more statues of these gods in order to, you know, win the favor of the gods. Not again, just completely made up, like so many other things in archaeology, but at least our island takes the biscuit. There was also a bird cult that existed on the island with the Rapa Nui culture. And there's hundreds of these bird friezes all over the place. But again, they're a different style of art than what's on the Maui. Now, I've actually seen a Maui in the flesh. It was at the British Museum in London, and they have one when you walk in the front door in the main lobby area. And I had a good long, like last year, I had a good long examination of it and took photographs of it. And what struck me was the it was so stylized. It was such a beautifully stylized piece of work. And it almost reminds me of some of uh, Henry Moore's sculptures from the 1940s and 50s. They had that, it almost uh, very much a modern art style. But what struck me by looking at the face and the proportions of the, the figures, that they weren't humans. Well, they weren't humans as we knew them. And it made me think of like, is this Lemuria or something like that? Uh, it was a different kind of people. They, didn't, they don't look like modern humans and they don't look stylized. They look like pretty much anamorphic representations of what they're supposed to be. Now, my passion for Easter Ireland developed about 15 years ago. No, it wasn't 15, about 10 years ago. When National Geographic did a story proving how the Moai statues were moved from the quarries to their, their, their final location sites around the island. And this team claimed to show how it was done with ropes and this is one of the most spectacular examples of scientific fraudulism i've ever seen in my life they when people see the think of the moai statues they always think of those iconic images of a from the chest up sitting on the side of a hill impressive enough the reality is they go down all the way to their feet and their feet are sometimes on plinths or stands but the National Geographic scientific team completely ignored this and gave them a kind of a rounded bottom like a Saputio player. And they rocked it along the road like this. A, a much light, light, lighter, lighter rep, replica, I might add. And then said, we, we've proven how it's done. But it was complete fraud because they've got, they've got legs and everything and a lower torso and right down to their feet. And they knew this when they did this piece of nonsense which makes me think there is a concerted effort to destroy anyone taking an alternative look in a serious way at the Moai on those islands. That includes possibly why they were all knocked down in the 19, in the 19th century, in the post-Darwinist era, to try and kill this concept that ancient people in ancient times had no technology. They did, you know, especially in the South Sea Islands and an island in the middle of nowhere. It also might suggest that Easter Island is but the top of a mountain of a once larger continent when sea levels were lower, because there's not the resources on, 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 on Easter Island to produce that kind of work in terms of, this is why they say it takes took place between 1200 and 1500, uh, you know, a 300 year time frame, because they claim that they have to wait for new trees to grow in order to roll them and and all the real food, enough food and stuff. Now, there's no evidence of any of that. Now, what's intriguing for me was the first thing is, why are they buried up to their chest? Now, we are told that that's 
that, that you know, I was assumed, and I have even remember reading things as a kid growing up, that it was volcanic ash. Fair enough, right? One problem, the vol last volcanoes that happened in, in Easter Island was 120,000 years ago. So that would mean that the, the Easter Island statues have been there for at least 120,000 years. So that's, you know, we're in the, the ballpark of like out there stuff now. Added to this, there just wouldn't have never been enough organic material on that island to accumulate that much topsoil in 50, in, since the 1500s. There's just not, though, because the island doesn't grow that many trees because of the way it's shaped and because of the accident. In fact, I don't think trees grow well there at all because of the wind. Trees often don't grow well on, on you know, we're, this island is as far south as Ireland and Iceland is north. Remember that. Even though it's a milder climate, it's that far south. The the Antarctica is really not much further. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's off the coast of Chile, but it's a two hour flight off the coast of Chile. And it's not, you know, so it's closer to Antarctica. It, it's not like in Chile, in South America. It's not jungle. And that also shows there could have been no organic material that carried its way in from a nearby landmass like South America because it's so far away from South America. So you're left with you're left with one conclusion only. That those those statues could possibly be. Two, two, two things. The first one is that that was once much part of a much larger land mass when the seas was lower. And that was the time the prevailing organic material from forestry and everything else have covered them right or you want to really go down the rabbit hole they're over 120,000 years old either way uh, the statues represent an enormous mystery and such an enormous mystery that again mainstream orthodox archaeologists aren't too fond of it now one of the like I'll give you an example of how orthodox uh, orthodox archaeology is, is, is mostly pseudoscience because they don't know any more than we do. They may lift up a stone and get a carbon dating on the Nita, but that soil under there has been disturbed by everything from rabbits to worms. It's not a, a, a good reading. And they have to fit everything within their still to this day at their out of Sumer theories. And they, they begrudgingly accept that Gobekli Tepe is as old as, as it is. They, they begrudgingly accept that. What chance Easter Island? And it's almost like it doesn't exist now. The, the National Geographic moving the megaliths, the Moai megaliths, was so fraudulent. It it could have, and they knew they knew that it went down for its feet. That's been known for decades, and yet they still they ignore it. Why are they lying? Because they don't want us to know or anyone to figure out how old the Moai are. Now there's there's other nonsense too that they found fragments of obsidian. And other materials nearby the statues, and they came up with the idea that the deep reset eyes had actual eyes on them. That's again one archaeologist doing art. That's not; they did not find a whole intact eye or set of eyes below the any of the Moai statues. They found fragments. This reminds me of the horrible exterior of Newgrange in Ireland, where some archaeologists did art. And I to the, the, the these all these white pieces of gra of uh, quartz were all around the front, uh, and making it look like a nineteen sixties shopping center when the actual restoration was done. Again, the, you know these archaeologists are the biggest pseudo scientists of them all when it comes to ancient stuff, and it, but not even ancient stuff. Like as you see from my own work into the Round Towers of Ireland, it doesn't have to be even super ancient. Who built the Moai? Well, I, I don't think it was the Rapai Nui culture. I really don't. I think they may have stories that were handed down from previous generations, but I think it was a previous culture. Are they 150, 125,000, 150,000 years old? I don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe they're part of the, one of the continuous resets. I'm more inclined to believe that the island of Easter Island was much bigger, and that's therefore that's how the accumulation of clay and topside built up. There was once more land, more forestry, more trees, and so on. And why uh, did the National Ge Geographic team do that ridiculous farcical piece of pseudoscience? And I believe a deception, quite simply because, and it may have started with the tumbling of the statues in the 1900s, 
it throws a spanner into the works of all the accepted timelines. So, Sarah, what do you think of that? I've, um, a few years ago, I followed your work about this, your thoughts on this, about giants, about the, it be, the being giants. And um, since then, it, it quite it resonated with me. And I, I got some um, information here that I found about lots of legends and um, sightings of giants in that area and on Easter Island by various explorers. And I also have a, come to a bit of a conclusion of my own at the end, if that's all right. Yes, um, please do. Okay. So, so bear with me if it's a bit long winded, but I, I do have a conclusion to it. So the first the first rabbit hole I went down after your thoughts about giants in that area was the um, Patagonian giants or the Patagons, which was said to be a race of giant hu uh, humans rumored to be living in Patagonia. They were described by early European accounts to have exceeded at least double the size of normal human height, with some of the accounts and recorded sightings saying that they were between 13 to 15 feet for the males and uh, 10 feet for the females. And in the 1520s, the crew from the voyage of the Ferdinand Magellan first mentioned them and said they saw them while exploring the coastline in South America when they were en route to the Maluki Islands. And one of the guys on the expedition called Antonio Pigafetta, who was from the expedition, wrote in his account about their encounter with natives that were twice a normal person's height. And he actually wrote in his diary that one day we suddenly saw a naked man of giant stature on the shore of the port, dancing and singing and throwing dust on his head. The captain general sent one of our men to the giant so that he might perform the same actions as a sign of peace and friendliness. Having done that, the man led the giant to an islet where the captain general was waiting. And when the giant was in the captain general's and our presence, he marvelled greatly and made signs with one finger raised upwards, believing that we that we had come from the sky. And he was so tall that we reached only to his waist, and he was well proportioned. And that was in the 1500s. And then in the later in the 18th century, there was more European discoverers of Easter Island who said that they saw living giants of men 12 feet tall. And so it's highly possible that there could have been a relict population on Easter Island right up to when the Europeans landed there. And there's just story after story in that area of giants. I've got I've got loads here. I'm not going to go through them all. But a man had visited. I don't know if you've heard of a man called Terry Dahl. He's a Norwegian explorer. And he sailed his yacht from Norway to the Pacific Ocean in 1983. He went from Oslo to the islands and he landed on Easter Island. Yeah, and Thor Thor is his name. Thor Diaholm. He he spent so much time he got married there in actual fact. He spent a lot of his time. He'd gone there with the intention of learning about island life, but the natives on the island were insistent on talking about the legends. Um, because to them they weren't legends, they were true stories. And one legend was that the first people on the island had come over the ocean from the west, while another legend was saying that they come from a hot and dry land in the east, and they would have been between seven and a half to eight and a half feet tall, some of them, and they were to have been survivors from some kind of worldwide catastrophe. There's just so many, and I'm wondering... If some of the various dolmens around the world, including those heads on Easter Island and the bodies underneath, could some of the dolmens be graves, the graves of giants? Is it possible that the Earth was populated with sub-aquatic humans who were giants back then? Because the Earth was really unstable back then and it was going through loads of cataclysms. So I'm open to the idea that these sub-aquatic giants might have been wiped out with Atlantis. Or another possibility is that 
being subaquatic, perhaps when Atlantis crumbled, they returned to the oceans to ride out the storms and they stayed there, leaving behind their statues. Yeah, the aquatic ape theory has been knocking around for a while. And I covered it somewhat in my own film on Malta. I find it interesting that all these small islands, Malta, Sardinia, and Easter Island are all associated with giants. And the same story that the, when the, the, the Homo sapiens or the Europeans arrived on these islands, the giants were still there. Now, it would make sense that they're aquatic giants because it's the same issue with the, with in, it's the dinosaurs. Either gravity had to be lower or they were in the water uh, because this is why blue whales are so huge. If you're on the land, they will die. They die all, they, the whales die immediately because their organs are crushed by their body weight. The same, like humans probably can't grow higher than eight feet. Their bodies will start to be destroyed when they reach adulthood. So this thing of the, maybe the gravity did change. Maybe the land mass was bigger. Maybe there was an Atlantis and Memoria. And they had to go, they were water bound, you know, and the Maltese stories are very, you know, you very much get that feeling that the humans, the Europeans and the, you know, and the giants lived together at one time. And the, the statues of, you know, if you want to people know what I'm talking about, go to my Beyond Room 313 channel and look at my my film on the, the, the giants of Malta. It's really quite remarkable. It's very similar to what Sarah is saying here. I knew about the Patagonia giants. It also, because of the proximity of Easter Island to Antarctica, and considering they could, and I'm, I'm just saying they are much, much older than they say, they could have been from a period where Antarctica, Antarctica was not glacial, and the land was not covered in ice. And we've talked about Antarctica before on this show, the strangeness of what goes on down there. So yeah, I'm down with both those theories. I think they all kind of work together, actually. So, um, you know, this is the thing. They don't know, but I think maybe if they, they have a suspicion. When I say they, I mean the establishment archaeologists. And they prefer not to even think about it because it's too much of a spanner in the works, no matter what the, the thing is. Well, just to put another aspect on it, as I was preparing for this topic and getting the material together, I wanted to know if there's been if there were sub-aquatic giants roaming the earth, then in the ancient times, and I wanted to know, perhaps, do human embryos still, have they ever had gills at any point during development? So I had a look around reading about that, and I found that, um, yes, during embryonic development, yeah. the embryo does have gill slits in the region of the neck, and uh, the slits develop into bones and eventually become the jaw um, of the inner the jaw and the inner ear. And I also discovered that um, the aquatic scientists had discovered a fish gene called POU. I'm, I'm assuming it's French for poisson, POU3F3. And it's a fish gene and it remains in our own genetic makeup and it is potentially responsible for the gill-like structures that are found today in human embryos. So modern humans still retain the genes for gills from our fish ancestors, according to scientists, and the scientists say fish ancestors, but if ancient humans were subaquatic giants, then they too would need gills to breathe. So I say aquatic ancestors rather than just limiting it to fish. And it could be that our descendants were from Atlantis and we're, we do in fact descend from subaquatic giants. There, yeah, I put it out there now. <laughs> And there's also the, the Dagon of Mesopotamian and Sumerian lore, these fish people that live in the sea, actually mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. And this is what Lovecraft based his esoteric order of Dagon of human uh, subaquatic star hybrids on. You have the Selkie stories, the Leviathans everywhere. And, you know, yes, absolutely. I think this would be a, if they, this is, you know, that, that theory is well established of the aquatic giants, especially if they originally came from a period of history where gravity, gravity uh, changed and it became more and more difficult to live on the land. So they went to live 
temporarily in the city. That's why I, that's the point I put across in my my Malta documentary, and then permanently in the sea before they became extinct and whatever. Perhaps these statues on Easter Island, then perhaps that was their their equivalent of what we do now when we paint portraits. Maybe they made statues of themselves. Oh, absolutely, and also the. They're not a million miles away from the statues of the, gi the giants in Malta. And they show most, the ones that survive are mainly female with pleated skirts and braided hair. And they have bulbous legs as if their weight of their bodies is falling down on their feet. And the famous statue of the sleeping lady that was found in, in the uh, Hypogeum House of Fellini, it's it's almost like it's an old giant and people are taking care of her because she's dying because gravity is getting stronger and she they can't handle the change in gravity but can't get into the sea anymore because think about it if the if the, the weight of them is disability is debilitating on the on you know on land when the climate is as when the gravity is getting stronger going into the water is a natural place to create buoyancy and then their internal organs aren't being crushed also the there are also megaliths in every single case, you know, whether they're in, and also there's loads of stories of giants in Ireland connected to megaliths. There's also, you know, but in say Sardinia and Corsica, they built, that would explain who built and how they built the colossal megaliths. They were just big, huge people. And they were able to lift up those stones and everything. And the same in there. Uh, in Easter Island, they were huge people, and they could. What what was the gigantic megalith to us is a, a standard statue to them. Yeah, and a lot of the stones, the large dolmens in stone circles, that could just be their equivalent of, or our equivalent of us sitting by the river picking up pebbles and making, just putting them down. It would be nothing, would it? Yeah. So, and the size of the actual Moai statues on Easter Island would have been this. Their full, their scale, just like statues in, in European classical antiquity, their scale, to the size we are. So I'm wondering if the statues could be some kind of um, some kind of way to revere certain certain members of the island, or could they be headstones for members of the island that have passed away if they've been buried at sea and they put a headstone there in memoriam. Well, I was just going to say, because a lot of the statues are based facing out towards the ocean. you got some Look, facing out and some facing in, yeah. Yeah, as if they said, we, this is when we existed, and then they, this is where we ended up. We went to sea, and we once lived. So they could be memoriams, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm only speculating, but... No, it's the, the, you, you're no more out there than any of the, the mainstream stuff. It's nonsense. So you, this, this is one thing that, you know, mainstream stuff is nuts on Easter Island. And uh, yeah, and, and the fact they've destroyed and damaged so, that so many of them since Europeans arrived makes me very suspicious. And it, it, it would also uh, make sense as to why a lot of the truth around them is hidden. Don't want yeah. you to know the truth of how old the, the planet actually is and how old the statues actually are and what was here before we were here, where we evolved, what we evolved from, because it would blow all the theory of evolution and all that out of the water, wouldn't it? Yeah, but it also, you know, there may be loads down under the sea that have yet to be discovered or even, you know, really throw the, the spanner in the works in, in Antarctica under the ice. Or, you know, it, it, I, often, I just find it also mind-blowing that Lovecraft, you know, put his Cyclopean underwater city so close to Easter Island at Point Nemo or near Point Nemo. You know, at, at this vast, meg you know, as Rael is vast megaliths down there. What a, I wouldn't be surprised if knowing, knowing what a seer Lovecraft was, that turns out to be true one day. Absolutely. And it's not just in the um, South Pacific and um, in the, in South America. The Native Americans also have lots of stories about giants. So it's like these these things what were part of the earth in the ancient, ancient times. Yeah. Yep. And they could have been mistaken for gods by your, the Europeans. Yeah, Easter Island is like... It's like a key or a legend or a cipher 
to an enormous aspect that's missing from the human timeline, both in human evolution and also cultural and social development. And this is why I, I, I think they'd rather not us thinking about it or have it seen, oh, it's just these Polynesian statues and that's the end of it. Because the Pacific, I just find again, islands, why islands? The Pacific islands are full of colossal megaliths that shouldn't really be there unless there was once a bigger landmass. The answer is Lemuria. You think that the giants could be the missing link that they talk about in the theory of evolution? And they've put Neanderthal man in there as just kind of a curveball to 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 bring you away from that. Well, there was an ancient human called Homo giganticus, a, a huge human. He was eight foot plus. That may be, he may have been more important in the evolutionary story than they're telling us. But when they say the missing link, they don't only mean humans. There's missing links in everything, flora, animals. They've never, they've never found a half animal this and half animal that not even close and so you know when they say missing link they're talking about everything not just humans so it was just goes to show you that these people have made a a religion out of science and become scientism which is kind of destroying the world at the moment and they're 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 as dangerous as religious fanatics quote in scripture and i mean we i we know we've i wrote a chapter for our upcoming book on the Hocus Focus book we're writing on, on this subject. And I have to say, I found that one of the most pleasing and enjoyable chapters in the book to write because it allowed me to get a lot of my own feelings about these kinds of things out there. That there's the human story is far more complex and it's more likely to reveal itself, like the film review tonight, in art, just like Lovecraft probably was throwing the truth out there about his own mythos. So I, Easter Island to me, I've given up now ever going there. I don't think I'll ever get there now, but that's okay. Uh, uh, in a way, I feel that I can just, I, I can still, uh, you know, I've been to Malta and Sardinia. I'm still looking at the places here around the island. So I can, you know, it's, it's as you, um, as you said, it's a, a global story and Easter Island is just one regional aspect of it. It's almost like some of the archaeologists are almost gatekeepers for the real truth, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, they are without a shadow of a doubt. And it happens right at the right, at the, right down to the uh, the the pit where they're digging for the samples. Uh, it'll nearly always be women down there, and it will always be a male archaeologist. And, and I've heard stories: the women will pick up something and say, "This is in the wrong mm. wrong strata," and and the, and the guy goes, "Well, just give it to me." And he puts it in his pocket. So and anyone will tell you in Sardinia, the farmers have pulled massive bones and teeth and of humans, gigantic humans out of the ground, and they send them to. They make the mistake of calling up the local university. The archaeologist comes out, and they never hear anything else ever again. Yeah, there was um, a piece here. There was a place in Rotuma, which is an island which is um, really far north of the main islands of Fiji. And during the Second World War, there was what they call shore watches or beach coast watches and they found shin bones over a meter long on the beach and the other shop soldiers um also found caves that were filled with giant human bones and nobody knows what's become of those bones when they were found they just disappeared like the maltese like the sardinians and the famous irish giant you know about the famous irish giant that they found and it went to england to be shown around different universities and then it vanished off the face of the earth it was a bog body of, of a man, yeah, of a giant. Fascinating subjects. It's I like how the the subjects go from one thing and then they they evolve into like we went from Easter Island to the giants. Yep, and like then there's that. also the final possibility that the that the the Moai represent beings that are not even from this world, not necessarily like from outer space, but from different dimensions or something, and they've gone off there. In fact, that's maybe what happened to the subaquatic apes. Apes they they migrated into a different reality, just like the fairies did. So that's our you know very eclectic and a roundabout way of talking about the Easter Island Moai statues. If any of you've been there or have your own theories, throw them in, and uh, we'd like to hear them. And uh, 
I still go to Easter Island in my mind. I travel there in my mind's eye at night. And maybe that's probably a good way to do these things well as well. And I'll never forget when I first laid eyes upon one in the British Museum. And the, 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 the look of this thing stayed with me forever. So those people, that those statues, if they are people on Easter Island of the, the so-called Moai, those shapes were there to make sure we recognized them and we never forgot them. Easter Island, what a mystery. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your four-leaf clovers and grab your Renfield Rain Max because whether it's raining cats and banshees or the sun is shining like a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, our favourite Irish weatherman has got you covered. It's Thomas with the Psychic Weather. Psychic weather this week is beneath the volcano. All during this week, I've been finding pictures of volcanoes, images of volcanoes all over my social media, including one incredible video I saw on Instagram where some people threw a boulder into a crater inside a volcano and started an eruption. And that seems a metaphor for where we are now. I even did a funny artwork piece of uh, on Facebook of, of the you know the, the guy looking at the other distracted by the other girl the, the two girls and the guy and the guys look at the other girl and I put the the guy's head as the Rona vial and the girl he's looking at's a volcano yeah so what would the volcano represent the shadow exploding to the surface as Carl Jung said us said to us that if you if you repress the shadow long enough it explodes to the surface in a fiery volcanic eruption. And that's why I've been seeing volcanoes all this week. Now, I was assuming or wondering if it, the explosion would happen as a result of the needlecraft, the prickly pear, and the masses suddenly waking up to what was done to them. Well, tonight, my hometown Dublin is burning because of something that happened there. Another issue that's been suppressed in the shadow, and it's 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 gone up like a volcano. The city centre tonight, and I think that's what it was. I was in the city last Tuesday, and the atmosphere was absolutely toxic. It felt like there was something going to happen, and it's happening tonight. So, it it may be happening in Dublin in terms of that riots and the city centre burning, but I think it's happening in other places too. The shadow has not been able to hold it down the reveal has come it is flowing to the surface and everywhere in people's lives and people's families and whole countries in everything you can imagine we're standing under the volcano and that's the psychic weather this week Knowing that there's a volcano erupting means you can get out of the way until the intense emotions and all that release passes. And I honestly wouldn't be surprised if we have a major eruption for real sometime in the near future. It's just a feeling that something's going to blow. Yeah, there's the whole as above, so below thing. I often wonder what psychic weather was like before Pompeii or before uh, Krakatoa yeah. or Mount St. Helens. Has there been any known any anything in the news about any possible eruptions? Have I dreamt that? Not that, not that I've heard. But you know, there's the, the volcanoes are so unstable; they can go any minute. Uh, we'll have to see. I think the last big one was the Icelandic one, wasn't it? <clears throat> was that the, there was a huge one in South America? But I think the last one that caused havoc was the Icelandic one about twelve years ago. Every week we unlock a cornucopia of Fortean and occult books that have found their home on our respective bookshelves over the years. And it's just our time to indulge ourselves in another show and tell, sharing the books that have not only sparked our imaginations, but also left a lasting impression on us. And our aim with this segment is to ignite a spark within you and inspire some new ideas for your next book to grace your bookshelves and build up your own Fortean libraries. 
And after last week's book review and its heavy subject, I've chosen something a little bit lighter and more enjoyable. And my book this week is Visions of the Occult by Fred Gettings. And some of you um, will remember that Fred also wrote The Law of the Cat, which I reviewed many months ago now. And in this book, he takes some of the strange and what people think are frightening images of occult law, and he gives a full explanatory text to them. And he uses full colour images, and I'll show you some in a moment, and photographs, and he talks about earth magic, <clears throat> man magic, sky magic, the astral world, witchcraft, demons, ghosts, alchemy, amulets and talismans, <clears throat> secret languages, magic symbols, divination and astrology, you name it, it's in this book. And it is a very densely packed book and very, very thorough. And it makes an excellent read from cover to cover, as well as a reference book and a coffee table book to dive into and open up on random topics when you want to feed your brain. And yes, it's even one of those books that you can take to the toilet. And he explains how occult symbolism is so ancient that it's part and parcel of everyday life and how many of the symbols that we use in our ordinary day-to-day -day life are rooted in the occult. And one of my favourite aspects of this book is how he shows the reader how to learn to recognise the hidden level of, me of the meaning of things that we see every day and how to develop your eye to this sort of thing. And everything's so well written and it comes with all these, I think there's over 200 um, beautiful glossy illustrations and photographs and it covers lots of ancient pictures and goes into what people overlook or what they misinterpret in the, in the pictures. And he tells you what the occult meanings and symbols are of many images and paintings. <clears throat> and in the chapter called The World of Man, he talks about how one of the basic teachings of occultism is that man is a miniature image of the whole cosmos. And he uses the diagram, the zodiacal man, and also the animate mundi to show how they are linked. Um, I'll put the picture on the screen for you. Uh, with the right hand chained to the Hebraic name of God, symbolizing man's link to the spiritual realm, and the left hand pointing down to a chained monkey symbolizing <clears throat> man's link to the material realm and then you've got man caught in between the two and if you see on the picture there the monkey is measuring the earth with a pair of caliber <clears throat> calipers symbolizing the scientific way that we see things and how things are measured here in the material realm now that brief explanation that I've just given of that picture merely scratches the surface of the insights offered by Gettins in the book. There's pages and pages on that on that image alone. And throughout the book, he just unpacks layer upon layer of occult symbolism, symbolism hidden within all these images and structures. And it's a, an invaluable book, really, for honing the ability to discern hidden meanings in images and then using that newly trained eye to see symbolism and meaning in daily life without becoming hysterical and accusing everything that's not understood as being satanic. It's highly worth a read for anyone who wants to learn about hidden occult symbolism and their true meanings and I'm just going to open it up now and just show you <clears throat> if I can. It's an ex-library book. I bought this, actually got this from the library uh let me get going there let me just open that up it's just page after page after page of images and you just go the detail that he goes into everything unbelievable it's an absolutely gorgeous book glossy um <clears throat> We've got the uh, the earth magic there goes into the dolmens and the megaliths and things, <clears throat> all the symbols that are scratched on there, black magic, um, everything, astrology. He he covers the two sides of the occult. He says you've got the dark side of the occult that focuses on the lower realms with things like necromancy and um, summoning demons, and then he goes into the higher realms of the occult which are things like astrology and divination um 
magic and magic that's of pure intent and things like that and and he just goes through pictures like this and he will go take you through that picture and point out all the symbolism that's hidden in there which to the untrained eye including myself you, you may overlook and he also explains how people misinterpret that's probably not the best picture to choose for youtube actually page after page after page it's a brilliant book <clears throat> Hours and hours reading that. Highly recommend. That sounds, that sounds fantastic. I've never even heard of it. I love the the black and white line drawings of uh, William Blake's uh, paintings. Clever. I've never seen them done as line drawings, uh, monochrome line drawings. Yeah, that's that. That looks fantastic. I've never even heard of it. I'm going to have a look out for that myself. It was published in 1987. So it's not Hay House and it's not Llewellyn. <laughs> I, I can tell by the, the, the style of the, the, the layout of the pages is from the 80s. Yeah. They were still using typographic machines before uh, desktop publishing was invented. It, it, honestly, it's they're, they're, that's what you was talking about, isn't it? Yeah. The great, the great architect of the universe, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it goes into great detail. They look, they look awesome. That. That was like, they, they look awesome. It's like a fanzine type thing. That's beautiful. That is after a beautiful cover. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, it's... John D and Kelly right, bringing the, the body to life at um, the churchyard in Preston. How about that? Oh, I didn't. See, my, yeah, that's because I'm so focused on, on what we're doing here. That's just gone right up. Yeah, synchronous yeah. time. And that's my book for this week. Yeah, my book this week is not a book. It's a second magazine I featured on it. And the reason why I'm featuring it is it's the 50th anniversary this month at 14 times. 50 years old. To, to describe the effect that this magazine has had on my life, but I couldn't do it in words. This magazine, 14 times, has been with me a constant companion for all most of my adult life it started out in the 1980s as as a fanzine called the news which is a strange name and it was literally published on a4 photocopied black and white paper and it was just a click a collection of news clippings in the uh, spirit of charles fort book of uh, the damned and just strangeness and since then it has become not only a continual archive and sort of like documentation of the world is just getting stranger and stranger but also it's philosophically changed i specifically noticed this during the 1990s when i started to read it uh, intensely and i've got i've got mountains of them in there uh, and it it started to talk about things differently. Like if in the early issues, there were straightforward reports and articles on UFOs, under the, still under the kind of X-Files thingy that it was aliens or something like that, or government secret weapons. During the 90s, it started to philosophically change and start to look into the some more kind of esoteric concepts of what these things might actually be that they may not actually be a, anything from space at all, which is what I believe. And um, it's still, I, the, the, the quality of authorship always amazed me in the editorial work. The standard of the articles, although it's a 40th magazine, it doesn't nail its colors to the mask. It, it does it correctly. It puts it out there. As a result, it often has articles written by academics who are the more open. You want to know where the open-minded academics are? They're writing for 14 times. And it's had the classical corner piece for decades. It's had many things on fairies and folklores. And it still continues to be amazing, not only the monthly updates of the, straight, the high strangers and 14 stories of the month, but also the fabulous book and DVD reviews at the back. It's resulted in tons of books, that is particularly the letter section. The letter section is a treasure trove all by itself. And it's one of these magazines that you buy it, you read it from cover to cover, and then it becomes an integral part of your own home library. Uh, and like I said, I couldn't put into words the 
the influence that this magazine has had on me since I was in my 20s. And I don't think I ever could. I'm extremely grateful for the existence of 40 and Times. And uh, it's been such a great thing, even as an artist or a creator, a writer, it's really helped me. And, uh, you know, 50 years this month, but it, it, it should, it's the greatest magazine that has ever been published in my opinion. And I can't imagine. I remember back in the day, years ago, when I was working somewhere in New York, and someone asked me, what, what is that magazine about? And I said, it's just a fantastic read. That's the only way I can describe it. It's just a fabulous read. And uh, that's it, 14 times. Thank you for 50 years of absolute, uh, absolute fabulousness. And uh, long may there be another 50 years to go. Give us a quick flick through. Okay, this month is, there's a lot of, now what I love about this month, you think they spend the whole month, uh, you know, blowing smoke up their own arses. We lasted 50 years, but they've very little p bits on that. They have stuff like Clive Barker and Neil Gaiam and stuff like that, saying how much they're influenced by the magazine. But they still have the news section at the front. They didn't, you know, it's still a standard issue. The news section at the front of the strange things that have been happening lately, ghostly goings on. And uh, then a thing about these, this, this, the Order of the Nine Angels satanic cult, a new story on that's a big thing at the moment. Do you have the classical corner, which I love every month? They have like our Fortiana from the classical world, or strangeness from the classical world. And then we have a, a thing on ancient games. Oh, look, the Melway of Easter Island. I haven't even, I've already, I haven't even started reading the magazine yet. I didn't even know that was there, just like your John D thing on the back of your book. So the, the sinks are flying. It it approaches conspiracy theories as open-mindedly. Uh, the, the, the conspiracy sphere. Now, I had people say to me that they're very skeptical. No, they're not. They, they're, they're actually being balanced on the conspiracy thing. They're not like Nexus, which believes all conspiracies. They're not. They're, they put it out there and they show that some stuff is nuts, which it is. And they have loads of, you know, uh, cryptozoology. The fairy and folklore section is a, is a constantly running section. I mean, I always amazed they have a necrologue of famous people of the 40, the 40 and who died, researchers, writers, authors. And then they have the, the UFO files. Then they'll have their main articles. This uh, The Enfield Poltergeist is featured this month. A new look at that. See, they're always going back to classic stories. They're not just reporting on the Enfield. Go to, you know the, they know that their readers... Uh, and here's a section made of Fort Bewitch you on the uh, people giving their appreciation for the magazine. Very little, though. They just, you know, a uh, bit of cryptozoology. Again. Oh, Satan and the social workers about the satanic panic. We covered that last week. See that? Satan and the social workers about the satanic, this time in England, which we didn't cover last week much. Uh Wow, this is so much synchronicity then, like ads. My favorite part, the book reviews at the back. And then they have the movies and the video game reviews and film reviews, TV shows. Oh, and they're making two movies of Geth the Talking Mongoose. Remember that? We covered that. It's in, our, now, it's in our book. Yeah, and that's our book. And now it's being made in two films. So Hocus Focus is really on the cutting edge of 40 and we're all moving in the same direction. And then the letters pages, which is fantastic. They go just people's perfect, not only personal experiences, but then their own thing, peculiar postcards. They always have like things on strange Victoriana stuff. A little thing on, and then it goes, that's it basically. And strange deaths is fe featured every month. How people have suffered off their mortal coil in strange ways. Yeah. So, I mean, like, even if you're not into the 40th, the magazine is pure entertainment and interesting and you know if i you know what like the way doctors and nurses leave magazines around their doctors and dentists leave magazine around there i would leave this all over the place in it because they'll tell you something they'd read this before they touch vogue or something like that or newsweek they'd rather read this if everybody read 14 times every week instead of vanity fair or the new york times book review this would be a much more interesting and happier world. And they've never sold out. As big as they've got, as global as they've got, they've never sold out. 
So we've come to the end of tonight's journey into the unexplained and we hope you'll join us again next week. And as always, and we can't say this enough, thank you for letting us be part of your Sunday night. And please subscribe so you don't miss an episode and also get over to Beyond Room 313 and go and subscribe over there as well if you haven't done so already. And please continue to share the show far and wide because you guys are our only form of advertising. So we really appreciate every view and every share that you invest in us. So we'll do a deal with you. You keep watching and we'll keep bringing you more episodes. And we can't say fairer than that. Yeah, as Sarah said, in 15 minutes or so, have a cup of coffee ready or a snack, a little beer, and then I'll be giving you two hours of VON on tour, which I, I assure you will enjoy. It's quite eclectic. Uh, what I talk about and some new things as well and uh, so yeah again thanks for sharing the show and getting involved in the same part of the conversation and speaking of conversation what's the tarot card this week sir <clears throat> the tarot of the week this week's card is the queen of cups and the queen of cups expresses the archetype of a nurturing mother radiating love and kindness and abundance and she holds a chalice crowned with a cross and in this vessel she sees visions but she also knows the importance of taking those tangible actions to manifest those visions into reality <clears throat> and with two praying angels on each side the queen of cups is a symbol of faith and spiritual connection and around her throne are three water babies, one cradling the prosperity symbol of a fish, while the other two are mirroring the Gemini sign on either side of the throne's pinnacle. And these water babies, or cherubs, are depictions of the queen's maternal instincts and nurturing nature. You can see that she's seated at the brink of an expansive ocean, the ocean of knowledge, the queen's feet rest upon pebbles and each pebble being a symbol of the bits of wisdom that grace our lives like treasures washed upon the seashore. And the queen's crown is also adorned with repeating patterns of physical pebbles and are also shown as a cluster on the chalice. And these symbolize her generosity and her readiness to share the treasures of wisdom and abundance that she holds. The water element central to this card is also shown in the scallop shape of her throne and the heart-shaped brooch that she wears around her heart. It's coloured in a pink hue and it's signifying love as at the very core of her being. And her fish scale cloak, which falls into the water at her feet, the lower segments of her throne are adorned with swirling water motifs and visually connecting her with the fluid element of the water. And that image kind of creates a sense of oneness as if she's almost an embodiment of the water itself. Even the queen's hair mimics the appearance of scales and further emphasising her close affinity with aquatic symbolism showing a deep connection to emotions, intuition, and the subconscious. And this strengthens the queen as a compassionate and emphatic guide. Now, this weekly tarot segment, being an overview rather, rather than a detailed spread, allows for a more general reading. And as such, the queen's presence encourages embracing emotional depth intuition and a compassionate approach in various aspects of life without the nuanced influences that might come into play in a more specific spread and the queen of cups in her predictive role heralds the arrival or influence of a deeply intuitive and sensitive woman in your life and this individual could embody nurturing and compassion demonstrating an absolutely remarkable level of emotional intelligence and there's a possibility of artistic inclinations and she might be drawn to fields such as medicine and caregiving and due to her heightened sense of sensitivity the queen is very very careful in choosing her close circle of friends and she may hold back at first or even appear slightly distant until she gets to know you and then when a genuine connection is formed she treasures it deeply just like how she holds her chalice.
This bond with you is not taken lightly and she invests in the emotional well-being of those she holds dear with positive support and influence, offering a source of understanding and care in various aspects of your life. This could be an ideal female partner who embodies a unique blend of fearlessness in intimacy and she has stability and the appropriate boundaries in her life. Her presence may also foretell the influence of motherhood and children in your life or the birth of a new creative project. And finally, this card encourages you to pay attention to your dreams because they may carry meaningful messages for you. The Queen of Cups is there to remind you of the importance of emo emotional honesty and loving behaviour in your relationships and endeavours, allowing for a more harmonious balance between intimacy and stability in all aspects of life. That's a that's a lovely description. The card I get lots of Queen of Cups in my life. I always seem to have women that want to marry me, and I, I know generally all my life it's been like that. But it was one thing about this card, you know, the way the geographic scenes in the background are hard to understand, not in the real places. I know the, I think it's the, the Knight of Swords. You can see the pyramids behind them. This always looked like, I know it's yellow here, but the White Cliffs of Dover. Mm. And even that rock formation on the end, I think that is on the end of the, uh, is there on the, in, the, in the White Cliffs of Dover. So does she represent England, Britannia ruling the waves or something like that too as well? This, to, to, if that is, if that's what was, she was aiming for when she was draw, draw, drawing the card, it looks like the White Cliffs of Dover and the rock formation in the end reminds me of it too. But there's something English about it, like Albion. There's something English about that. And we were just talking about Queen Elizabeth, the fairy queen and that kind of thing. It's a lovely card. And like I said, I get, I, I get, I get all my life. I've had Queen of Cups, mammies like that. Even that woman that taught me about to do the tarot, the French, the older French woman, she was like that, you know, like a mammy kind of thing. But yeah, I like the Queen of Cups. She's all right. Good night, all. Good night. <laughs>